بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا إلى يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري يسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا إلى يوم الدين All praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Peace and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So today, bi-ibnillahi ta'ala, brothers and sisters A uh, quick reminder, first of all, apologies for yesterday And jazakumullah khairan to the shaykh who covered the slot that was allocated to me Barakallahu fee And today what I will do is just do a brief reminder to, As we are approaching towards the end of Ramadan um, As the excitement of Eid starts to set into us and our arrangements for Eid become more and more important. I want to just talk about uh, three things today. One is a hadith which is extremely profound in its meaning. And one is a, a, a few points from Surah Al-Kahf, which is a surah that we should recite every Friday. And finally, about what we are searching for in the last 10 days. Okay? So the first hadith that I think Sheikh Riyad Hafizahullah mentioned uh, a few days ago, one of our teachers, in his talk that he gave in the local masjid, which was, uh, if you have not listened to the recording, I strongly suggest you get a copy of that recording. It was very, very, very beneficial. He referred to a hadith which was as follows, that two men both became Muslim at the same time with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they both entered Islam. And one of them was martyred and the other remained alive for another year, then he passed away. So you have two people, they both entered Islam on the same time, same day with the Prophet ﷺ. One of them went on to give the ultimate sacrifice that a person can do, he became Shaheed. And the other one lived another year extra and then passed away. And Talha ibn Ubaidullah said, I was shown Jannah in my dream. So he went to Rasulullah and said, I have shown heaven in my dream. And in it, I saw that one, the one that who was delayed, the one, the two brothers I saw entering Jannah, one of them was delayed and one of them went in first. And the one who was delayed was the Shaheed, was the martyr. And I was surprised. A shaheed, his position is so high in Islam, the person who sacrifices his soul. And the other individual who lived just another year and then went into Jannah. I was surprised, how comes the shaheed went second? So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, I was surprised. So I told the Prophet ﷺ the next morning about this. And the Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Did not that person who lived an extra year, did he not fast Ramadan? after the other one had left this earth. And this was the hadith that, did he not fast Ramadan after he was gone and pray 6,000 rak'ah or such and such a number of rak'ah that, that, that the prayer does in one, what somebody does in one complete year? So this hadith shows that to proceed in entering Jannah, those who, as we know in our Islam, those who enter Jannah first have a higher rank. As they are described in Islam, they have brighter faces. They are like the, like, like the bright faces and the next have less bright faces as they enter Jannah. The first to enter Jannah are of the highest ranks, for example. But why was it that the martyr, a martyr who's guaranteed six things, was guaranteed that when, whenever the first drop of blood comes out of them, they are forgiving all of their sins that they, that they see their place in Jannah. That they don't have any punishment of the grave. That they will have no fear on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That they will be given a crown on their head, of which one of the jewels is more precious than the world and all that it contains. That he is able to intercede for 70, 70 members of his family. That they are given a beautiful spouse. This. This, these six things given to the shaheed, yet this person who lived an extra year, who was able to do an extra one year of ibadah, which includes Ramadan, preceded that individual. This is food for thought. That we are in such a profound period in our life, that Allah has given us 
the opportunity to breathe and to extend our life into Ramadan, that we should be looking to get the highest goal. This is why when we ask in our du'as, Allahumma yarzuqna jannatul firdaus, we ask Allah, not just jannah, we ask jannatul firdaus. We always want to be at the top. We always want to succeed in this life that everybody is so keen to be successful in. But the akhirah, we should also try to be keen to try and be the first to enter jannah, to be those who are given the greatest reward. So this hadith, you can Google it, you can find it, you can ask your teachers. But the hadith is extremely profound and the ulama have given a lot more explanations with regards to it. Now, with respect to Ramadan, which is also known as Shahrul Qur'an or often referred to as the month of the Qur'an, where the Qur'an is recited, etc, etc. I thought I'll, sh I'll, I'll cover the next maybe 20 minutes or so, if we can get through the drumming. Um, to 20, 20 minutes or so inshallah and then I want to finish off with another reminder for Ramadan to link it back to Ramadan but in the next 20 minutes to actually look at the Quran the Kitabullah and, a, and the surah of the Quran that we have that we should all be reading every Friday we've been listening to most of the Quran now people are on which juz now Sheikh Shami? which juz are you on Sheikh Shami? 27-20 most people now are coming towards the end the last Ten Jews of the Quran, they're somewhere in this realm. And subhanAllah, our ears, if you've been those who have been going to one particular masjid, you have been following the entire book of Allah's speech, of Allah's kalam, which is profound. And in most cases, it will be that we may have an emotional attachment to the recitation, the voice might be good, we might pick up a few words here and there, but to understand the book of Allah, to have the impact of what Allah is saying can only be achieved. Can only be achieved if you spend some time and effort and struggle and difficulty and dedication and allocating time to accessing the book of Allah. Whether it's through studying in English through translations, whether it's studying through Arabic and striving to learn the Arabic language, whether it's to study a tafsir class regularly, this understanding of the book of Allah will not just come in like a lightning bolt. It's something that you need to spend a lot of time and sweat and energy and sacrifice. So the verse of the Quran Surah Al-Kaf is a surah that we should recite every Friday and the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith, whoever recited Surah Al-Kaf in the same manner in which it was revealed, and the Muhaddithin explained the importance of Tajweed using this, as it was revealed to recite the Quran, as it was revealed, not in our mistakes or in our dialects or in, in, in some of the, the luggage that's come across into the recitation of the Quran, no, but to recite the Quran as it was revealed in our Anglo-Saxon jaws or our struggling of the haruf, you struggle to try and read it the way it should be read. The Prophet ﷺ said, it was revealed, it will serve for him as a light on the day of judgment for his and whoever recited the last 10 verses and it and it happens that the jal should appear after that the jal will not be empowered would not be empowered over him will not come over that particular individual who reads this Abu Darda also reported in a hadith that the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said anyone who memorizes the 10 ayahs from the beginning of the surah al-kahf will be protected from the jal so Surah Al-Kahf is made up of essentially four stories. Um, and if anybody can shed some light on what are those four stories? If anybody, any, any one of those four stories? The of the cave. The, the, uh, the, are you going here or this is from you? No. That's fine, so just check out, I'm just joking. So Ashab Al-Kahf, people of the cave, yes? The, the two people of the garden, yes? Zul Qarnayn, yes? Uh, Musa and Khibar. Good. You got a good Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm talking about it. Mashallah, good, mashallah, good. So, this is um, referring to Ahl al-Kaf. And as we know, in Asbab al-Nuzul is a study of the reasons for why certain verses of the Qur'an are revealed. This is an entire subject that the people who study Qur'an and Tafsir, it's some Asbab al-Nuzul, which is the reasons for revelation. Usually, sometimes people would come to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him a question. And then the answer would come in the form of revelation. Okay. And this was where the Jews of Medina, Al-Yahud min al-Medina, challenged the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They said, what is the ruh? They asked him about 
and they asked him about what is it about those young men who slept for a long time. You heard this story. And what is it about this huge man, this powerful man by the name of Dhul Qarnayn? So there are three questions that they posed, two of which are answered in Surah Al-Kahf and one is answered in Surah Al-Isra. Okay? So, Ahl Al-Kahf, those people of the cave, which is the first story that is, re is referred to in the Quran, is basically a story revolving around people whose deen was tested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ So they were young men, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Quran, we narrate unto you the story with truth. Truly they were young men who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. And we made their hearts firm and strong when they stood up and said, Our Lord, our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Never shall we call upon any God other than Him. If we did, we should indeed have uttered an enormity in disbelief. These, our people, have taken for worship gods other than Allah. Why do they not bring for them a clear authority? And who does more wrong than the one who invents a lie against Allah? The young men said to one another, as Allah says in the Quran, and when you withdraw from them and that which they worship ex except Allah, then seek refuge in the cave. Your Lord will open a way for you from His mercy and will make easy for you your affairs. Now, some of the Mufassirin explain that these young individual men were people who had a lot of luxury. They had a lot of um, um, ease and comfort because they, they had come from very noble families. Um, some of them even Mufassirin explaining that they were the children of the leaders of, of the Byzantium Empire at the time. And they would gather together to do their shirk, to worshipping other than Allah, sacrificing to other than Allah. And these young men who didn't know one another, they had an inclination in their heart that these people, what they're doing is wrong. They felt that this was wrong, this was not right. And they would sometimes distance themselves from that group, distance themselves from the party. And the narration goes that one of them first went away from this whole festival of shirk and zulum and sins. And he moved towards near a tree by himself because he didn't feel right. And this is something that, you know, reverts often refer to. Even when they were not a Muslim, they would say, I just didn't feel right drinking that wine. I just didn't feel right eating that pork. Because there was something there in their fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then honored with Islam. There was something there that their fitrah wasn't washed away. You find this very common. That, you know, this is why Rasulullah would say, Istafti qalbik. You know, quite often, you know what's right and wrong in our life. And we just have to search inside and we know, no, no, this isn't right. Instead of going to everybody in the world and finding out, no, you know it's not right because if you're connected to your fitrah, you will have that feeling, you will have that inclination. So and one of them had that feeling and he went to the tree and then another one came next to him and he sat down and another came and he sat down and they were brought together. And Aisha radiallahu anhu said, so, This is the, you know, yeah. Yeah, so the, the um, yeah, so Aisha radiallahu anhu said that souls are like recruited, recruited soldiers. They recognize one another and they will come together and they recognize one another for the truth. So these guys, they didn't know one another, but their only relationship was they were all searching for the truth. Like many people who are Muslims and, and if you're active in Islamic societies or you're active in your community, your bond is la ilaha illallah. It's not driven by nationality or language or culture or custom. It's driven by La ilaha illallah. And these men came together for La ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then made their hearts firm and strong and they stood for their deen. And when the kings of that area realized, oh, well, look at these people, they, have, they, they, they were questioned, they were asked, why have you done this? Why are you doing this? And they said uh, uh, that we are, 
You, they, they were, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran, learn, they said, we, 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 we will never accept other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they, they referred and replied to the tyrants of the time, those who were committing these sins, that, you know, we are not from the liars and the transgressors. They used very strong language for that. And then they were punished or they were about to be punished. And Allah subhanahu wa from his rahmah, Allah gave them, them an opportunity to escape. And then they ran away. And this is one of the um, um, proofs used for people to, to run away to protect your deen. To protect your deen, you can run away. This is something that can happen and does happen, unfortunately, to this day. And they went and they ran away and they hid themselves in a cave. And they, they, so they, 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 they left and they fled to the cave where they sought refuge and protection. And then their people noticed that they were missing and the king looked for them all over the place, but they were unable to be found. And this is very similar to the story of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi with Abu Bakr anhu when he escaped and they ran away and went into the cave and Allah hid them from the disbelievers. And again, as we know the hadith, the famous statement that most of you would have heard of, Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think of two who have Allah as the third? You will be protected. So they were then put in, the, in, in this cave and they stayed in this cave. And what we have to remember now is that these individuals are in the cave and there's a discussion in the Quran about how many were there, which one was the dog, which number was the dog. But this was not of that much of importance. The importance was that they were people who had, who had protected their deen and iman from fitna. And they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they were in the cave for 309 years. And they were kept alive for this period for 309 years. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, because they were alive, Allah moved them. Allah says in the Quran, Allah moved them from their left side to the right side. You like, you know, people who are bed bound in hospitals. And doctors will explain, you know, the, the beds that they make, the body has to move. They have to always rotate the body from this side to this side. Or they have those air mattresses to keep the pressures changed. Allah moved them. And Allah makes it very clear in the Quran when he says that he moves them from right to left. And they lived for 309 years. And wasbid nafs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to talk about wasbid nafsaka ma'al ladheen yad'oona rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashiyyi yuriduna wajha. And the verses of the Quran go on to explain about them and keep yourself on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam patiently with your companions, those who call on their Lord morning and afternoon seeking his face and let not your eyes overlook them desiring the pomp and glitter of the life of the world and obey not him whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance, one who follows his own lusts and those whose, whose affairs or deeds have been lost. So these were the ones, the story of believing men and they decided to leave their homes to protect their Islam because their Islam was important. The next story that we come across is the one of the two gardens and I won't go into all the text details but I want to take out the crux of the points that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in the story of the two gardens refers to the test of what somebody thinks is what they have only made that this is me and the story is about we have to understand that Allah is the Khaliq Allah khalaqana ja'ala malik He is the owner He is the creator and He is the one who makes everything we are not like Qarun who is described in the Quran as well who said that he owns everything that he is self-made and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swallowed him up we are not like Fir'aun and the Mala'a who think that they were the ones who had everything. You are not the owner of anything. This is the whole message of this story. You don't even own your own bodies. And وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ فَأَصْبَحَ حَشِيمًا تَذْرُوهُ الْرِيَاحِ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we put forth to, you, to them the example of this life of this world. It is like the water, the rain, which we send down from the sky and the vegetation of the earth mingles with it and it becomes fresh and green. But later it becomes dry and broken pieces with which the winds scatter and unto Allah belongs everything. In this section of the story, the man who Allah had blessed with was given a garden, but he forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he transgressed the boundaries. In this whole chapter, this, the verse of the Quran also comes Al-Malu wal banuna zinatul hayat dunya That kids, you know, this is a very common trait throughout history of human beings. Al-Malu wal banun to, to have wealth and to have sons, to have children, which is a thing that people measure success by. But this is not the only thing that should be driving us. This should not be the thing that should be uppermost in our minds just to attain these things in this world. So this also refers to the whole thing about not bowing to Allah, not having that humility, and we have to understand that we should humble, us, humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Know that everything that we have is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this money or this wealth is not something that we have attained, but is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first one about protecting your deen. The second one about the trials and tests of the dunya. And the third one, which is the story of Musa in Khidr, which revolves around the fitna or the trial and test of knowledge and Musa السلام, was a Nabi of Allah who was knowledgeable who had ilm, who had knowledge but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, when Musa was asked who is the most knowledgeable person on the earth he said me then Allah revealed to him that there was someone else more knowledgeable than you and Musa السلام, was told to travel and go to this individual and this individual was called Khidr and Musa is a prophet. Musa said to Khidr, may I follow you so that you can teach me something of that knowledge or the guidance and the truth path, true, true path which you have been taught by Allah. He said, Khidr said, verily you will not be able to have patience with me. So this story is where a series of events take place which apparently, from the apparent understanding, is clear that Musa السلام, doesn't understand why did Khidr destroy these ships? Why did he kill this child? Why did he fix this wall? These are three distinct incidences that take place. But the whole ruling of this is to show us to be humble. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows more than us. And the knowledge that we have is a, is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is a humbling process. And in the final part of the Quran is the issue of Dhul Qarnayn. And here is a allusion to the fact that he was, there's nothing really proven in history who he was. People make claims that they're particular individuals. But he is somebody who had power from Allah and a huge number of soldiers. They could take any country over. And the story of the great king that joined both knowledge and strength. He had ilm and he had strength. And they traveled to all parts of the earth, helping people and spreading goodness. And he even overcame the pro problem of Gog and Magog, Yajuj and Majuj, by building a dam that was able to put to work, that was able to put to work the strength of his people. And he was able to help that particular group of people. And this refers to the trial of responsibility that you should have, you have responsibility, but at the same time that you will be successful in your responsibility if you fulfill your rights to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these were the main stories that come up in Surah Al-Kahf. And then obviously the beginning hadith that I said that people refer to the Surah Al-Kahf is there for protection from Dajjal. And the Mufassirin often explain what's the connection between Surah Al-Kahf and Dajjal the Antichrist who will come and Imam Mahdi and Isa alayhi salam all in, 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 on this planet they will descend 
And Dajjal, the link that they often explain is that Dajjal will appear before Yawm Al-Qiyamah and he will test people with four things. He will test people with four things. One, that he will test them in their religion. He will tell them to worship him instead of Allah. Like the young youth, they left the worship of other than Allah to worship Allah. Secondly, he would test people with wealth, like the people of the two gardens who thought the wealth they had attained was because of their own efforts and not because of Allah. What will he do? The Dajjal, he will order the sky to rain and he will tempt people with his wealth. Number three, the trial of knowledge, which is this trial of Musa and Khidr. The Musa, you do not know everything. We have to be humble when we learn from others. That, and that, and Dajjal will try people with knowledge due to the, how he reveals the information that he has. He will have profound information. And fourthly, the trial of authority, Sultanat, authority. He will control major parts of the earth. But in Dhul Qarnayn's example, we have Dhul Qarnayn who had knowledge and he also had strength. So the Mufassirin explained that this was the, was the connection. And then at the end of the surah, the profound sentence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which summarizes, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُمْ وَاحِدٌ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ So, I, I'll, uh, say I am only a mortal like you. This is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say I am only a mortal like you. It is revealed to me that your God is one God. Therefore, whoever hopes to meet his Lord, وَمَنْ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ The one who wants to meet his Lord, what should he do? فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا He should do good deeds. وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا And he should not make any partners with Allah or do any kind of shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Surah Al-Kaf. This is Surah Al-Kaf which is, you know, really the reason why I've gone through this very speedily is just to show that the very minimum, the very minimum that we should know about particular surahs of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Taha, Surah Yaseen, Surah Al-Kaf, Surah Al-Anbiya, we should know what was the, what's the general gist of it, bang, 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 they should be in our mind. So when the Qur'an is recited, we can connect to these story, with stories. When these words, words are recited, we can connect to the stories. And this is not, this is not tafsir, this is just a bullet point, you know, bang, reminder. Just to show us that the meanings of the Qur'an are there and we should be accessing those meanings. And now finally, as I close, because I will not extend to long, inshallah. I want to refer to what we are seeking in these wonderful last 10 nights of Ramadan. We are in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. We have been blessed to be breathing and living and witnessing Ramadan. We have been blessed to be fasting this month of Ramadan. And Aisha radiyallahu reported that she asked Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and forgive me if this is repetition for some of you if some of the other shiuk have covered this. That Aisha radiyallahu was asked asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if I knew that if I knew which night is Laylatul Qadr what should I say during it? And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, everybody all together, Allahumma innaka afuwan tuhibbul afwa fa'afu. Fa'afu. Okay, so people should have memorized this. Now, this is not a big dua. This is a pretty small sentence. But know that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us this sentence, that there must be some treasures in these words. There must be something in there. He was given profound speech to Rasulullah, small words, profound meaning. Allahumma innaka afuwan tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anni. The muhaddithin and all the YouTube reminders and all the little articles on Laylatul Qadr, they all refer to one simple explanation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all says, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allahumma innaka afu. The word used is afu, not ghafar or maghfira, not just forgiveness. So if you look at the Arabic language, your afu and maghfira are generally translated as the same, forgiveness. But the word afu is where we have to make a dis distinction between afu and maghfira. Allah maghfirli, we say this, Allah maghfirli, Allah forgive me. But here the word used is afu. And 
Maghfira, let's understand what's maghfira. Maghfira is if we get maghfira, if we get maghfira, which is a forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah will cover your sins in this dunya. He will not expose your sins in the akhirah and He will forgive you. He will not punish you. That's what we want, right? Everybody's made mistakes. Everybody has a history. Everybody has a track record. Everybody slipped up. Everybody has a past. We still will make mistakes. We will continue to make mistakes. But we want maghfirah. We ask Allah to forgive us. This is what we're seeking in Ramadan. This is what we seek even more so in the last 10 days of Ramadan. Oh, Allah forgive us. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, a curtain will be placed. This is for the one who's been given maghfirah. A curtain will be placed between you and the rest of the people and you will be with Allah. You will converse with Allah. You won't need a translator and Allah will forgive you your sins, but He will recall your sins. Do you remember you did this? Do you remember you said this? Do you remember you ate that? Do you remember you went there? Do you remember you went here? Rem do you remember you hurt this person? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Oh Allah, yes, I do. Yes, I do. You be reminded of your sins. Those of you, the, those of the sins that we have forgotten as well. We would have forgotten them, but they will be reminded to us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was satartu kafid dunya. I covered those sins in this world and I forgive you today. And we'll be given maghfirah. But just to be with Allah and for Allah to remind you of the disobedience you have done on this earth is a very painful experience for somebody who loves Allah. Somebody you love and they tell you, remember you did this to you? Remember you did this? Remember you did this against what I wanted? Just somebody in this dunya that you love. Your spouse or your mother, your father, your son or your daughter. Oh, you did this, you did this, this mistake you made with me. This was, this, it will hurt you. This is with Allah. Even though Allah will forgive you. But Allah will go through those things with you. And you will think you're doomed and you're finished. And that's it, case closed. But Allah will give you forgiveness. This is maghfirah. This is maghfirah. Afu is another word entirely. Connected to maghfirah, afu. Allahumma innaka afu wan. Tuhibbu al-afu fa'fu anni. This afu is in the Arabic language means to erase away entirely and to wipe away entirely. The Arabs use this often to describe the, 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 uh, when the camel walks and, the, and the, wind, the wind blows over the sand and those footsteps or those camel steps have then been gone away and there's no sign, no trace of them. It's gone as if the camel never walked on the sand. Allah says in the Quran as well, the other meaning for afu, so to erase and eradicate and the other meaning of afu as mentioned in the Quran, is plentifulness, excessiveness, lots and lots. So when the Muhaddithin put this together, you're looking at your, your, your sins to be totally erased, never to be mentioned ever again. And to be given the maghfirah in plentifulness. To be reminded of your sins, you'll be nervous, you'll be scared. But Allah will not even remind you those sins will have been, have, will have been wiped. Totally. Clean of the slate like they never happened. This is afu. This is why the dua is Allahumma innaka afuwa tuhibul afu fu'anni. So those of us, dear brothers and sisters, as I close, should we not run to Allah? Should we not beg to Allah in this blessed month where this dua has been given to us? And, and seek this blessed night that Allah can give us in Laylatul Qadr to say this dua? Those of us who continue to lie, who have lied, who get angry and will become angry. Those who backbite, those who delay their salah, those who don't wear their hijab, those who are disobedient to parents, those of you who are taking rib, any of the sins, sins upon sins upon sins. Should we not use this to Allah, for Allah to forgive us our sins in these last 10 days of Ramadan? And if you cannot do good ibadah, if you have a problem that you're not worshipping Allah properly, that you find it difficult to worship Allah, this is because you've been shackled, that you've been held by your sins. A person came to Ali anhu and he said to Ali, I used to be able to pray. I used to be able to pray at night with ease, but now I find it difficult. And Ali said to him, you have been chained. You have been chained by your sins. What you do 
by being disobedient to Allah has an effect on how you live your life. They are not separate entities that we box away, that we are a character in school, we are a character at work, we are a character when we are at university, we are a character with our family, we are a character when we are outside, that we keep switching and changing. Our sins, whatever we do in each of those respective circles, has an impact on us, has an impact on our ibadah, has an impact on how we lead our life. We can't play the game. We can't change our mask with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mask you have is one with Allah. We can't play lip service to Allah here and do other things behind His back that you think you can do. It doesn't work that way. We are who we are. Allah sees who we are. And we have to be honest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have to break away from those sins. We have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. He would prepare himself literally shidd al The muhaddithin explained that this tightening of the belt was literally like rolling up your sleeves. One explanation. The other one, he would not go close to any of his wives. He was very focused on his worship. Then he would wake up the whole night in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wake up his family in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ramadan is finishing, dear brothers and sisters. This is a crucial night that we should be trying to seek. There are particularly vivid ahadith describing the morning that follows Laylatul Qadr. Well, it's neither hot nor cold. The sun's rays come out in a particular way. Then you should try to do this on a clear night if it's not raining. Then go out and look at Fajr time. You know, try to pray Fajr on in these last 10 months and try to do. Um, 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 Salat duha, you know, try to pray your two rakats, two rakat when you when, when the sun has come up. Try to extend it, fight your nafs a bit, just a bit more. I know people are tired, I know people are exhausted, I know it's been tough. But after Fajr, stay awake. Try and see the sun rise and see and have some good news in your heart that maybe you caught Laylatul Qadr. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as I close, inshaAllah ta'ala, that He gives us the tawfiq and energy to see it to the end of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq that the good habits and the good worship and the good routines that we have developed in Ramadan, some of it rubs off for us for the entire year, inshallah, until the next Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the days that we have fasted and the Quran that we have listened to, that it has an imp impact on our hearts, on our minds, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really really forgives us our sins, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma inna ka'afoon tahibu al-afwa fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are the you, you are the one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that 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 loves to forgive, so forgive us. You are the one that loves to forgive. You are forgiven, oh Allah, and you love to forgive, so forgive us. So the, yeah, that's all the points I wanted to cover today, inshallah. I hope it's a good reminder for all of us. Use your energy. Only a few days left, inshallah. Ta'ala. Barakallahu alaykum, inshallah. Okay, question there's any um, questions that you would like to ask to the topic or anything, anything you'd like to add of benefit to everybody? Barakallahu Go ahead, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Just a quick about the hadith, the first ten verses, is there another hadith or the same last ten verses? The last ten verses, yes, that's correct, yeah. Uh, Surah Al-Kaf you're talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. To protection from Dajjal, um, there is a hadith on the first ten so, um, ayahs. And there is also a hadith on the last ten. So the safe bet is to memorize both. First ten and the last ten. Or even all. It's even better. <laughs> that's even better, yeah. yeah. And, and really, there are, there's a lot of literature available now, mashallah, in English. Those of you who, who you know, don't, don't go to the Arabic, on summaries of the Qur'an, or bullet points of the Qur'an, we must have some appreciation of what the Qur'an is saying. What's the message of the Qur'an? This is a revolutionary book that we should understand. Inshallah ta'ala. Anything to add? Inshallah ta'ala. Oh, yes, sister, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We've, we've been having a stronger connection with the Quran, and one of the things we want to carry on is maybe some sort of tafsir class mm. that would. We can't have daily classes. Could we rely on you to maybe start something for us? Like even if it's every one, one no, but no. What, what I would recommend is that first of all, um, I'm not an alim, I'm not a scholar. 
Um, so it's way without, way outside of my remit to do any kind of tafsir work. What well, this is just a simple um, summary of Surah Al-Kaf. But what what I would urge you all to do is number one, is the scholars in the community, and I will speak to RMCI, is to at least have a once every two weeks tafsir session. That's something we could try to identify ulama that can help us to do that. I think that's a very important thing. Number two, there are some very good materials available on the net that do, they have done some really good pieces of work. I know the, the actual human interaction of listening to somebody is, is the, the real way of studying Islam. This is the way that Islam has been taught, not through YouTube, not through MP3 tracks, and not through um, 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 just listening to um, audios. It's taught by human interaction, attaching yourself to an alim, um, visiting scholars, sitting with them and to benefit. If you cannot do that, then there are some good. I'll come to you once again. There are some good lectures available that you can find on the net. Uh, Numan Ali Khan has done a fantastic piece of work. You have Sheikh Yasser Jangda, who's done a fantastic piece of work. His tafsir, mashallah, is, is, is very worth listening to. And you have a lot in, in reading materials as well. So whether the tafsir happens or not, sister, one should themselves say, "Khalas, I am going to start on my journey to access the Quran now." After Ramadan, I'm going to have my plan. Two, three days a week, I have to sit down and study the Quran. But um, we, I think the, the idea of um, doing something regularly is something we will discuss with OMCI, inshallah, bi And let's see what we can come up with that will be suitable for everybody, inshallah. Barakallah, for your suggestion. Oh, yeah, sorry, Satya, Barakallah, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. طيب بارك الله فيك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك. Few more days left. Crack on everybody. Keep going, inshallah.